I think we should uh, get going if if we can, please. Uh, the schedule is quite tight, so if I could have your attention. Of course, the first thing to do is to welcome you all, those of you who are here at University College and are able to join us in person, and uh, equally welcome uh, all the people who are joining us uh, online. This, as you may know, is uh, the second in uh, the series of Voices, a conversation series uh, that we began uh, six weeks ago uh, on the Voice to Parliament. But before I go any further, uh, I would like uh, to acknowledge and pay respect uh, to the traditional custodians of the land where we live. We are honored to be on the ancestral lands of our First Nations. They are the guardians of the earth and of all things that grow and breed in the soil. They are the trustees of the waters, the seas, the streams and rivers, the ponds and the lakes, and the rich variety of life in those waters. We thank them for passing their wisdom and heritage to every people since the dream time. We acknowledge the wrongs done to them by newcomers to this land, and we seek to be partners with them in righting these wrongs and in living together in peace and harmony with them and with the land, our common home. We look forward to the day when Australia will formally recognize them listen carefully to their voices, acknowledge the wisdom that lies behind those voices, and extend to them the justice so long overdue. We were going to uh, begin with a little bit of music in the background, uh, but uh, this creates too many technical complications, so we leave that to one side. Uh, this is uh, the issue we're dealing with tonight. Uh, Australia drift in the turbulent seas of US-China rivalry is one of the defining issues of our time. For Australia, for Asia Pacific, uh, one could say, for the world. And uh, it is clear that um, we cannot rely necessarily on our mainstream media to inform, let alone to analyze. Uh, what uh, is likely to happen, as has been the case now for some time, is for communications media of fear. I'm sure everyone who reads The Age would have seen yet another front page, top secret war gaming intensifies China fears. And everybody should be suitably frightened by it all. That's the message. Are you sufficiently frightened? And if you're not, we're going to frighten you a little more. That is it. So this is really the purpose. It's not the first time we're dealing with this issue and it won't be the last, but it's at a critical moment for reasons that I'm sure some of you are aware, perhaps most of you. We've prepared a little kit, as you can see, uh, which has today's program first up, and then a series of uh, pieces um, analyzing the issues we face, Australia, the Asia Pacific region and beyond including a couple of pieces by our speaker, Scott Birchall, and uh, others, uh, including, uh, in, in the interests of balance, uh, the four-page four uh, uh, article in The Age by Peter Harcher when it, we, it was announced uh, that we are on red alert. And also uh, excerpts from the just recently released declassified a part of the Defence Strategic Review, uh, and then a range of other uh, bits of analysis about where, where we're at. Uh, do feel free to share it with others. Uh, a little question, and then we'll pass over to our speaker. Please 
as I speak, think of the people you know, all the people you know, not just one or two, family, relatives, in-laws, the lot, cousins, nephews, nieces, distant, close, doesn't matter, think of all of them. Think of friends, current and past, I'm thinking, we've already reached close to 100 mark, at least. We know 100 people under those categories. Colleagues, former colleagues, professional associations, unions, etc., etc. all the people attached to those. If you're a member of a group, a church, a sporting club, think of them. You're thinking. Come here, you're thinking. But this time you've got, oh, I would say, Roughly 150 to 200 people, some less, some more. Now, this comes the question. Do you think the people in your network, don't worry about anybody else's, just your network, the people you know, neighbours I should have added, the people you know, are they on top of the issues we're discussing tonight? Are they? Hands up those who say, yes, the people in my network, not all of them, but a substantial number, are on top and following it closely. That tells you the story. That's where we're at. And the question that I hope we will begin to address, what would it take for the majority in a room like this to be able to put their hands up? What would it take? Unless we can answer that question, it is grim. Grim. Okay. Uh, right. Now, let's, uh, let's just a little exercise, which I always enjoy doing in relation to any issue. Because at the end of the day, as uh, someone was, uh, I think, rightly quoted as saying, tell me the conversations people have and I'll tell you what kind of society we have. All right, time to introduce our speaker. Someone I've known for a long time, though I haven't seen him for a very quite some time, and that is uh, Dr. Scott Birchall. He's a honorary fellow in international relations at Deakin University, where he taught for many years. He's the author of several books, including The National Interest in International Relations, uh, misunderstanding international relations and uh, various other works, including co-author of theories of international relations. He's taught at Monash University, the University of Melbourne and the University of Tasmania. He's a regular commentator on the ABC radio and television. And he's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him to speak to us this evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk. Um, as you said, an issue which uh, deserves wide discussion, and uh, I hope some of the things I'm going to say tonight might provo provoke some of those discussions. Um, I'm dividing my talk into three short sections. Uh, context, uh, the reactions of the West, and current problems and challenges. So let me start with just some context. Um, for the first time in centuries, a non-Western country has risen to become a great power after decades of humiliation and legitimate historical grievances, mostly long forgotten or, in fact, never remembered. I think it's helpful to see this as, a, as part of what Hedley Bull in the 1980s called the revolt against the West, which he defined as the struggle of non-European or non-Western states peoples and political movements to challenge the dominant position of the Western nations in the international system. Now, China's extraordinary um, modern economic growth, sponsored in part by Western transnational investment in manufacturing, has enabled greater military spending, though less than a third of what the US uh, currently spends. Um, I think it's just... Uh, just over a quarter, somewhere between a quarter and a third. Um, you also be aware that the United States has 700 plus 
military bases around the world outside its own territory, China has won. As realists would tell us, this is normal behavior for a rising great power, whether it's capitalist or communist. The second thing they might say is that imputing motives from capabilities is an old strategic error. However, this hasn't stopped Defense Minister Richard Miles placing China's unprecedented military buildup as a justification for expensive military hardware acquisitions announced recently. It's important to note that China could in fact, or is in fact spending significantly less than it could if it wanted to match the level of US military spending. And as a share of government expenditure, China's military spending has steadily declined over the first two decades of the century. So you need to be, have a much more accurate picture of just what is going on. If you've seen Richard Miles in recent interviews, his first justification for the uh, AUKUS submarine purchases and the responses in the Strategic Defence Review is this talk about an unprecedented military uh, build-up. Well, perhaps he might discuss Japan's, which uh, um, is doubling its military expenditure in the next uh, few years. Um, but I presume he's not referring to that particular country. Now, the rise of China is axiomatically seen as a threat, not to the security of the West, but to Western hegemony, specifically US regional primacy. Beijing does not take orders from Washington, and that's intolerable. Um, in the literature, it's called successful defiance. So the West versus the rest paradigm is still deeply entrenched in Western thinking, particularly the Anglosphere. Um, and we're seeing now, as I'm sort of alluded to, increasingly bizarre and unconvincing threat scenarios, aggressive China, military expenditure, communism, etc. And as I said, these are not referring to Japan's military buildup um, or the very one-sided number of military bases which exist uh, in, the, uh, in the region um, on, the, on the side of the United States. Now, China, of course, has its uh, significant challenges of its own. It's a highly unequal society. Uh, by some metrics, it's just the largest economy in the world, but it's only 85th on the Human Development Index. Um, so uh, levels of um, poverty, the uh, gap between rich and poor, levels of corruption within the bureaucracy, a dramatically aging population, and fears of demographic shifts if, if economic growth uh, collapses are the preoccupations of the Chinese Communist Party. These debates and these internal concerns are very rarely heard in Australia. We're always talking about China's interface with the world. Um, we ought not to forget that China is preoccupied with a number of almost insoluble internal problems which are going to preoccupy policymakers and strategic analysts. Um, the West, of course, especially Australia, needs China as a, for trade as a low-cost manufacturing base to complement the economic interests of transnational capital. However, it's interesting and important to note that US capital is not monolithic and is divided between two sectors, what I call a consumer sector, the manufacturing sector where iPhones, computers, white goods, et cetera, are manufactured, and the military sector, which arms, uh, provides arms for Taiwan um, and has a vested interest in exaggerating the so-called China threat. So when we talk about US business, we need to understand there is a significant tension there, and that tension has played itself out in the past, in the recent past, and we might take that up in some of the Q&A. But uh, the last thing that US transnational investors want is a conflict with China. The, those, on the other hand, who want to sell arms to Taiwan and to develop new fighter aircraft with longer range for the US Air Force have a very different interest. So important to note, US capital is not, is not monolithic in this sense. Now, while the US has a geopolitical comparative advantage in weapons and violence and intervention, China is undermining this comparative advantage with one of its own, 
economic development programs in Eurasia and the global south. Uh, the new Silk Road, both land and maritime Silk Roads, uh, Chinese overseas lending and development finance. Now these are threats that violence and weapons cannot overcome. And China knows this. So when we talk about the China threat, if you want to break it down into its component parts, having the strongest military with the most military bases in the world is not going to do a great deal for the United States when China is becoming much more appealing to the developing world by providing um, financial assistance, development assistance, um, banking and financial services, et cetera. And that's one uh, problem that the US has barely begun to consider, let alone counter. Unfortunately, everything about China is now refracted through the lens of military competition, military arms, expansion and violence. Okay, let's turn then to the reactions of the West. Now, the United States has viewed China with hostility really since the middle of last century. Um, according to historian James Peck, in the 1940s, Washington labeled China a puppet. In the years of the Sino-Soviet alliance, the, to the early mid 50s, Beijing was Moscow's independent junior partner. In the 1960s, it became an expansionist force and a feared revolutionary model. Other Chinas followed. China, the skilled geopolitical player in Soviet American Chinese triangles of the 1970s. The human rights violator with economic development potential of the 1980s and the 1990s. And now China, the uneasy ally against terrorism. And at last, the economic behemoth. Now, each of Washington's Chinas has been have been simplistic ideological formulations, largely intended for a domestic audience. As Peck argues, none of them were accurate. They were assessments of China, not as it was, but as Washington needed it to be in order to pursue strategic, certain specific strategies. Even before the 11th of September, 2001, Washington designated China as the greatest long-term challenge to America's ambitions for global hegemony. So there is talk, of course, about Chinese uh, aggression. And when you drill down, it amounts to land reclamations in the South China Sea, political and civil restrictions introduced into Hong Kong, uh, the treatment of Uyghurs, treatment of Tibet, threats to invade uh, Taiwan, but the overall message is the same. China is outwardly expansionist and therefore must be countered. And the only counter for that is an is increasing military force. Now contrast this with promiscuous US interventions around the world since World War II. Which is the most belligerent state? Okay. So the narrative that's being developed on China today depends on the forgetting of what modern history has told us about the United States. You can't have one without the other. So if you want to talk about interventions in other countries and violations of sovereignty, there's one state that has to be excluded because it's the you know, class by itself. And China is not it. In fact, as a rising great power, China has been conspicuous by the lack of interventions that it's made um, in uh, territories in the region and elsewhere. So we've seen re the revivification of Sinophobia, um, containment policies, uh, military dominance and greater military spending. And in the case of the United States, effectively spreading NATO to the Asia Pacific region without saying so. I guess if you can expand the Eurovision Song Contest to include Israel, you can include uh, uh, you know, China, you can include the Asia Pacific in the North Atlantic. Um, but of course, this brings back memories of discussions that the Americans had in the 1950s about losing China as if it was China's was theirs to lose, right? theirs to control. Um, Martin Jacks talks about hegemonic angst, the problems of uh, what do you do about rivalry when another player comes on board and you can't necessarily stop it from uh, reaching its potential. The official US position is quite open and uh, transparent. Quote, to encircle China with a ring of sentinel states, heavily armed with US supplied precision weapons, aimed at China, backed with huge naval maneuvers in the Pacific. 
with the addition of nuclear armed B-52s stationed in Guam, South Korea, and uh, shortly, I suspect, uh, Northern Australia. So China has been represented to us as a threat, and interestingly, interestingly, under the Morrison government as a communist power, that somehow or other, this is news. It's almost as if some journalists and academics have only just discovered that China is communist. Um, despite, uh, and they're seemingly oblivious to what are decades of university courses in the rise of China. Um, but of course, selling the fear, selling the threat is much easier if it's cast in communist terms. This is, enables you to demonize your enemy without having to go much further into the explanation, into the depth and detail. Um, these same people who prosecute this seem untroubled by the mining boom and the extent to which China s secured Australia from, the, from recession during the global financial crisis. What, of course, the reality is that the Chinese leadership during the last years of their, sorry, the, uh, like the Soviets during the last years of their uh, period in power, the Chinese political elite does not believe in Marxism-Leninism or communism and hasn't for decades. They know it doesn't work. And they, even though they ritually encant it, it's nostrums to justify one party rule. So the, it's, it's almost as if the only people who really take the idea of Chinese communism seriously as an expansionist ideology are the Cold War warriors in the West, journalists, we've, Joe referred to, academics and others, ambitious people who uh, have carved out lucrative bureaucratic, journalistic and academic careers out of anti-communism. The West refuses to acknowledge that China has legitimate national interests which do not align with the West's, nor is there serious analysis of China's strategic ambitions in the mainstream media. If you don't include the words fear or threat in each paragraph, it's unlikely to get to, to print. The world acknowledges the one China policy, but acts as if Taiwan is independent and should be protected from the sovereign power we recognize as owning its sovereignty. And of course, this has now become a major pretext for increased military spending. So we can actually refer to China invading its own territory, similar to you know, Australia invading Tasmania. All right, let me turn to the last of our summaries, and this is current challenges. There was a choice. We could have inter tried to help China integrate into international society. Unfortunately, we chose to exclude it. So one of the, if you read back at Hedley Bull's uh, uh, Haggy lectures in the 1980s, you'll see he had a, almost a roadmap of how the West could open up international society to non-Western players to give them a much fuller role in the car, in the structure and leadership of international institutions and a role in carving out international law and international norms. And despite the compelling need to work cooperatively on climate change, nuclear proliferation, North Korea, the West is trying to contain China and is particularly concerned by growing Russia-China ties, especially, of course, in relation to Ukraine. But the, we ought to understand that the, the Russia-China marriage is one of convenience, largely, if unintentionally, arranged by the United States due to its antagonism and open hostility towards both states. So don't be surprised that you actually get what you set out to achieve and then lament it. Australia has unwisely chosen to even more closely align itself with US naval policy in the Asia Pacific, effectively enhancing the encirclement of China. So the Quad, AUKUS, the DSR 2023, the Defence Review, Marine, US Marines in Darwin, US bases in Pine Gap and elsewhere, they operate on one common theme. China's rise is a growing threat which must be countered with massive increases in military spending. The result, a transfer of, uh, at this stage, $363 billion of public funds to private mili military contractors in the US and the UK, and a more aggressive anti-Chinese uh, strategic posture. 
I saw in the recently in an interview a couple of days ago that this figure may increase below out to half a trillion dollars by the time uh, we actually get to 2040 when some of these uh, submarines actually appear, if they will. All of this is against our most important trading partner, which happens to be nuclear armed. Under the AUKUS acquisitions, Australia's nuclear powered submarines will be focused not on defending Australia from hostile powers, but on supporting the US in its determination to project power regionally and globally. For example, the infiltration of exclusive economic zones under the guise of freedom of navigation. How can this lead to anything other than increased tension, an arms race we cannot win, and further estrangement from the region we say we want to integrate into? I think only today Indonesia and Malaysia expressed concerns about the AUKUS uh, acquisitions. None of our neighbours are displaying the same kind of reckless hostility or sub-imperial vicariousness that we are. We seem to have locked ourselves into an adversarial strategic posture, not of our design. Uh, Pro-US factions within the ruling Labor Party, pre-socialised, I guess, into a pro-US view of the world, have ensured a seamless transition from or the AUKUS initiative of the Morrison government with little internal debate and virtually no external consideration. We've gone from interoperability to interchangeability. So far from retreating or moving away from the Morrison initiatives, the Albanese government has in fact taken them to the next level. To many, Australia has become a vassal state an adjunct of US maritime policy, which has very different interests to pursue. Despite the fact that China has never expressed any aggression towards us or any intentions of challenging our sovereignty. Uh, they are quite happy the fact that we're basically a quarry. Um, they're getting what they need from us. They don't, uh, there's no particular reason why they would want to risk um, some sort of strategic attack to achieve what they already get without it. Unfortunately for Australia, all thoughts of an independent foreign and defence policy have been abandoned. Foreign Minister Penny Wong can talk all she likes about a multipolar order in Asia, but her policy is aimed at reinforcing US primacy with unconditional support. And it's interesting, uh, I can, uh, anecdote, uh, we had Defence Department people come to our university a few years ago in, as part of a strategic review preparation um, where they effectively defined a balance of power as US primacy. So you need to be careful about the language. When they say we want a balance in the region, what they mean is we want to maintain the status quo, which ensures US primacy, which is called the very opposite of anything to do with balance. Only a week ago, and you see the Americans are still in denial about a lot of this and still haven't picked up the changes in the region. Only a week ago, a US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen gave a speech in which she said, China's economic rise is fine, providing it acknowledges US leadership. <laughs> in other words, terms dictated by Washington. It's almost as if they've learned nothing. Washington is already in an economic war with China, especially in the uh, high tech industries. It is pressuring the Netherlands, South Korea and Japan to break off exports to China. Is this a strategy that Canberra wants to support? But more importantly, and perhaps the most fundamental question is, what is the end game here? Old Cold War binaries and enduring hostility based on the need to maintain Western military dominance in the Asia Pacific at all costs? Can the permanent enemy hypothesis be sustained forever when China holds significant appeal to the global South and to other states less wedded to Washington's worldview? Old Australian foreign policy themes have resurfaced to undermine the regional contours carved by Paul Keating and others. We have fear of abandonment in a hostile region, ALP fears of being seen as soft on China and national security, 
bipartisanship robbing voters of meaningful policy choices in defence policy, blind attachment to a road state in relative decline, a reversion to forward defence instead of the defence of Australia. So in summary, and to finish, Australia is clinging to a worldview that in very significant aspects is no longer relevant to the modern world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Scott. Um, a very interesting tour of uh, the situation globally, regionally, and as far as Australia is concerned. Um, clearly, for, even from what you've just said uh, in your concluding remarks, we've come a long way from Whitlam's abandonment of forward defence. He said, never again. Um, We've come a long way from Keating's, our most important relationship, most important is Indonesia, which meant the United States is not it. It requires some explanation. How have we come to be where we are now? What's happening? Well, if you ask Keating, he'll say that we've lost our nerve and that policymakers in the ALP have stopped making policy, as you said before to me privately. There are just no new ideas and no one with the courage to put those ideas out, even in opposition. And let's say they had nine years to sort of broach some of these subjects. So no new ideas, no courage to take on the status quo, um, no intention to sort of say, well, is there another way here? Is this the future that we need? And the way to do that, of course, is just to be short term, is this short termism, constantly responding to the news of the day or the news of the week, but no long term planning, no, uh, nothing to say, well, what are we going to look like in 25 years? Even the Defence Strategic Review assumes some sort of ongoing hostility or the idea that somehow China will one day wake up and pack it in. You know, just say, oh, we are, okay, you won. You know, we'll, um, we'll go back to being a subordinate power in the Asia Pacific. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, and I was in uh, New York three weeks ago when uh, uh, a couple of people who I, whose views I, I respect said that um, the Ukraine war is a greater catastrophe for US foreign policy than 9-11 and Iraq. And that is because it's suddenly re revealing the United States and how weak it is in its ability. It's losing traction in the Middle East. It's, so China is now negotiating deals between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's also now proposing a, you know, to negotiate between the Palestinians in Israel. And um, Ukraine itself. And Ukraine itself. Um, highly embarrassing for a, a country which is used to ruling the world. And uh, um, those, there's no real response to it. There's no coherent response. So we've now got Biden moving into pre-election period when, as you know, no new ideas ever get broached about anything. They're only focused on getting re-elected. And China has uh, infinite patience. It just has to wait it out. Um, the, all of the metrics are in their favor. And um, China is now asserting a, a role that is very appealing to countries like Brazil, where Lula visited uh, China recently, uh, Macron went to, as you know, went to Beijing and said that uh, we no longer necessarily take Washington's orders or instructions on how to solve some of these issues, including Ukraine. And add all this up, and there's a gradual reduction in the influence of the United States. So there's, that's the direction of where things are going. Where's Australia going? The opposite way. Wedding ourselves even more closely to the United States in the hope that somehow or other um, the worldview of Washington's will be benign enough for, to help us out. Um, of course, uh, it's um, not necessarily going to play itself out that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking, of course, you're talking about government, uh, but whether it is a Labour government or a uh, Liberal or coalition government. Me, you. you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Whether one speaks of uh, a Labour government or a coalition government, 
uh, they are to a, some considerable extent going to be uh, influenced by the advice they're getting uh, by Defence Department, uh, the armed forces, uh, the many security agencies which have dramatically grown in size in recent years, their minders and advisors, um, the kinds of institutes, strategic institutes like ASPI and so on. Uh, it would take quite a bit of uh, effort, energy, and uh, more than just courage, wouldn't it, to ignore where this is leading, the kind of push and advice they're getting, let alone the, the mainstream media, and go in a different direction. It would, although they've had nine years to start. That's the thing. I mean, they've had all that time in opposition to start preparing the ground. And I think one of the reasons why Keating is so angry in his response is that he thinks, okay, you've taken nine years to get back into government, and what are you going to do? There's not a you know, tissue papers difference between you and, the pre and your predecessors. So you've got to government, you've finally you know, got yourself in power, where you're in a position to do something, what's the first thing you do? Albanese on the day after being elected jumped on a plane with the Liberal Party advisor and headed to, uh, to see Biden. Um, so I think uh, it's, there's a lack of will. You know, sometimes we, re we often cast Australian foreign policy and defence policy as being reluctantly drawn into these things, reluctantly, um, uh, unfortunately got into certain circumstances where we can't get ourselves out of. I think this is really inaccurate. I think Australia is enthusiastically in favour of these policies. And when I said that the Australian government, and if you look at Guy Rundle's piece in Crikey you know, about two weeks ago where he says, this is all part of a factional deal. Uh, the, you know, the shortened faction and the um, other factions within the ALP who are extremely pro-US. These are the people, for example, that when uh, Gillard was challenging Rudd, went to the US embassy each day to give updated briefings to reassure them that she would be okay. That's, that, just think of the mentality of that. Your first priority is not to coalesce with your own colleagues, but to reassure the United States that even though Julia Gillard came from the nominal socialist left of the ALP, that she doesn't believe any of that. And she's going to be, you know, she's going to enjoy herself handballing a Sharon football in the White House. And she, you know, escorting Obama around as he announces the Darwin Marine deployment. So I think we mistakenly believe that the ALP is somehow trapped or stuck or can't do anything. They're just not inclined that way. They just don't think that way. There's just very little difference between the two. And uh, that we, as a result, the one thing that they've done is given us continuity uh, between governments uh, in terms of defence and foreign policy. Obviously, there's greater competence in some of the domestic portfolios, but in defence and foreign policy, you just cannot, it's impossible to distinguish between the two. Mm. And that's not a reluctance, that's a choice. That's a decision they've taken. And uh, as Rundle, I think, wrote in the party yesterday, he said, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what the rusted on ALP supporters, the old style ones who've been around, who expected more than this, what they do. And yeah, I guess, where do they go? You know, where can they go from here? Mm -hmm. uh, uh... Well, f to follow up on this, um, would you say that there's, in part, one of the reasons for lack of um, uh, a, a more long-term, independently minded perspective is that they fear what mainstream media might do to them, especially in the lead up to the next election? Well, as you said in your remarks, you wouldn't go to the mainstream media to be informed about issues anymore. But that's not the way the government sees the mainstream media. It sees it as the gateway to massaging public opinion. And as you know, it's increasingly difficult in the mainstream to find um, any significant spectrum of opinion on any of these issues. Um, you might, for example, in the past have said, well, okay, the age in the Sydney Morning Herald would counterbalance what you'd find in the Australian. Now it's, if anything, the almost the roles have reversed. You've got as you said, with the Red Alert series that Harcher and others ran, this idea that if you're not scared of China and they're about to come over the horizon, um, you're being irresponsible. 
something wrong with you. There's something clearly you know wrong. You're not reading the right material, or you're uh, reckless, unprepared. Um, now, of course, as I said, and there's lucrative careers to be made out of this sort of stuff because everyone wants to know what the next threat is and where it's coming from. But there's almost no real basis for real reality at all. You can explain China's behaviour and China's rise without having any reference whatsoever to its ideological, the ideological position of its ruling party. This is just what great powers do. They've got more money to spend on defence, so guess what? They're spending more money on defence. That's what they do. But to impute a threat by that and therefore respond by allocating half a trillion dollars of taxpayers' money to respond to it just gets you into a cycle of, of an arms race in the region, which is hardly in our interests, I would have thought. Mm. But, of course, they, they still want to maintain the trade relationship and uh, opening uh, even... Uh, more than has been the case now uh, to Australian exports. So it's a two-track policy. Uh, uh, this China, by far Australia's biggest trading partner, commitment to maintaining that and the closest possible alignment with the yeah. United States. Can this two-track policy be maintained? I don't think it can. And in fact, the, the previous Labor government acknowledged it couldn't. I don't even remember the old white paper of 1984, the Beasley uh, Hugh White wrote, saying you can't aim your guns at the people you want to buy pro that you you want to buy your products from. You can't do it. It's a logical uh, incompatibility. Um, and the Chinese have responded in a fairly moderate way. It has to be said. There's been obviously sanctions, which are being eased off, but. Um, China is by far, as everyone knows, the most important trading partner. Uh, we have a trade surplus, I think, with China. Huge. And it's very few countries do. And its ability not only to save us from the GFC in the past, but also as an increasingly important investor, as well as a trading partner, outweighs Source a of lot students. Of, source of students who are coming back, finally. Um, to alienate those with the sort of uh, aggressive strategic postures, sending submarines that um, we have no, uh, nuclear submarines, we have no history of actually being able to maintenance or sub you know, substantiate, with time frames that extend into 2040, uh, which is about 10 governments away. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's ludicrous. It is ludicrous, as well as being harmful. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, would be money would be much better spent setting up about 10 more consuls in China, in every major city in China. So the Chinese, have, we, so Australia is interfacing with Chinese on a diplomatic and commercial level in every major city, at a fraction of the cost, of course, of what they want to spend. And uh, you, know, you just have to ask, uh, if China doesn't threaten us, um, what is the purpose of this money being spent? Yeah. Um, you mentioned in relation to the US that uh, uh, capital has opposing interests. Those who do very well out of the relationship with China, the economic relationship, this is the US, uh, and those who um, have other interests, whether it be Taiwan or s somewhere else. Would this not apply to Australia too? Uh, would business that does an, a roaring business in relations with China not become in time, over time, increasingly concerned by the drift, current drift of policy? I would have thought so. I, mean, I was always wondering what the mining sector was saying to the Morrison government behind the scenes as they revved up the anti-Chinese and Sinophobic sentiment. I, there must have been knocks on the door, I'm sure. Those of you might remember just before 9-11, the Chinese forced an American uh, plane to land, I think it was Hainan Island. They stripped it, took it apart, photographed it, put it back together and eventually gave it back to them. And um, uh, the Bush administration was in its early years before 9-11 and started to really get a fulsome anti-Chinese sentiment. And there was a lineup of CEOs from Silicon Valley at the White House saying, cool it, cool it. Where the hell do you think we get our products made? We don't want to, you know, just calm down. 
Now, you know, we haven't got obviously the same transnational presence in the world, but you would have thought the mining sector would be extremely alarmed by some of the statements made by the Morrison government, and yet they're their financial backers. Mm. Uh, now, presumably, that sector didn't get as badly affected as, say, the wine industry did, That's right. and, uh, and now some of the other agricultural sectors. But uh, still, um, that's well, your bread bun. The bread main bread. one, of course, is iron ore. It, it just dominates yeah. Australia's exports to China, tens of billions of dollars every year. And the Chinese were very careful not to uh, apply any sanctions in that area. But the, but the message is clear. We could. Yes. And remember, China, I think China imports 95% of its energy needs. Um, that market is not going to go away. And uh, Australia would be economically suicidal to simply vicariously through pressure from the United States, sabotage its own commercial relationship with China for no particular gain. Mm. Um, it's almost as if there's no other option that no the idea of regional integration of either playing a peacemaker or a, a bridgehead towards all of the issues that were that drove the Hawke and Keating governments in the late 80s and early 90s it's almost as if that never took place as if it was it's far too difficult or we can't be you know can't be trusted instead we're responding to alarmist intelligence reports a very weird extreme interpretations of behavior that by any comparison is benign when you compare it with the one, the, the behavior of the country we're allied with. So um, it's very hard to understand some of this. The question is, will there be a, um, a backlash? Uh, there will be a backlash within the ALP. As I said, the rusted on supporters of the ALP, but as, as usual, when a labor government lets down its base, where do they go? You know, where do you go? Uh, they may lose some votes to the independents and the Greens, but ultimately um, they're not going to go back to the Liberal Party. So Albanese knows that he can play this a fair way before he, he repercussions, really serious re electoral repercussions emerge. But if there was a continuing shift to independents and Greens, uh, their majorities in at least one of the two houses, and possibly both, might over time be, be at risk. That's true. The Greens, of course, if you look at the uh, foreign policy and defence policy, the independents and the Teals, uh, they're no radicals. No. <laughs> so um, uh, they're on reasonably safe ground there. Mm. Um, Greens are a different matter, but um, the Teals are still going to be there for a while, providing a kind of shadow social democratic backstop uh, alternative. Um, so I think Albanese knows that. Um, it's just a pity that um, this is the moment when governments have a chance to actually do something. It's the early stages when you get a chance to sell you, you know, put the policy in effect, deal with the consequences, sell it properly until you have to face the electorate again. You don't want to be doing that in the lead up to an election. They've decided clearly they're not going to do that and uh, they're and, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that there's no exaggeration that the pro-US factions within the ALP are as pro-US as they are in the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be surprised. Well, I think it's time for some questions. Uh, we, what we're going to do now, people online can put their questions, if you haven't already done so, in your chat box. And uh, we have Eshan here, who will uh, closely monitor what questions are appearing in the uh, chat box, and we'll turn to him to convey to us uh, some of those questions in a moment. But I'll give people online time to uh, place their questions on the chat box. In the meantime, uh, let's have a few questions. I assume there will be some uh, from uh, those attending here in person. Uh, and. Uh, before I recognize anyone, I always like to see, over a period of three or four questions, a little bit of agenda balance. Huh? So uh, if you want to uh, ask a question uh, and you're male, I'll recognize you, but every so often I'll want to make sure that there are some uh, um, uh, of our uh, sisters here 
who are also getting a chance to pose a question or make a brief comment. We'll start with uh, John. I'll bring you over a microphone just so the people online can hear you. Because you can't be heard online from where you are. Okay, so just hold it for a second. Thanks very much. Clearly, there's a lot of evidence for the for the approach Scott has outlined, but I, I think it's uh, un, unnecessarily simplistic. I, I don't think, for example, that he was he was fair about Penny Wong's media uh, uh, press club uh, speech. He, uh, 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 many people have argued that. Uh, the, there were inconsistencies in that. Well, of course there were, but but it was in uh, a, a framework of seeking peace, and there was much more in it about ways of of, of contributing to that than than you've recognised in what you've said. I, I I don't think that you've uh, reflected the political situation adequately. You've been you've just said Labour Party is what the what the present ministry does. There's going to be a fierce debate at, at the national conference. It may not lead to any change, but I think it's highly likely that it will. Labor has, has split three times in, in Australian history over international relations. And, and, and many people are aware that this is uh, the sort of sellout that you've been talking about and will strongly oppose it. Uh, there are also many people, as Joe has brought out, who, who uh, business people, who, who will be very upset by by any continuation of hostility. And in fact, what actually has happened in in relation to the Australian Chinese uh, uh, relationship in the last year has been an increase in, in dialogue, uh, and dialogue when there was none before at all, but, but, it, but it has increased. John, we need to move on. Yeah, okay. I, I, I hope you'll comment on these okay. comments. I think you know, ultimately what you say in a press club speech and what your options are may not be the same. Um, Penny Wong emphasized the need for multi polarity in the region but the actions of the government don't lead to, are not leading to that. There, we, everything, every decision that's been taken, and you'll see it in the quad meeting coming up uh, in the next week or two, or is it yeah. next couple of weeks, uh, that every decision that's taken is reinforcing <laughs> US primacy in the world. Where's the, where's the, where's the multipolarity? The US is leading the world. They do not tolerate sharing great power in the region. It never has, it never will. Um, that's it's not, not even a controversial statement. But the question is, what options does uh, Australia have? Well, you can say whatever you like in a public forum. The actions, where's the money going? What, have you, what, have, what decisions have you taken? And the only interpretation of the decisions that have been taken in recent times suggest a reinforcement of US maritime policy in the region. You don't buy, spend 500 and over a you know, billion dollars to reinforce multipolarity with submarines. You are contributing towards a US maritime policy in the region. And they're quite open about this. There's no, it's not even my interpretation. It's a, quite an open discussion. It's called interchangeability. We'll have US naval staff on uh, our submarines. Now, uh, what we'll do now is take two or three questions in a, in a cluster, and then you'll have a go at two or three questions okay. together. Do I have any women hands going up? Oh, thank you. Yes, please. Um, I was very interested in your speech, Scott. I think uh, it clarifies in my mind and confirms in my mind uh, the views that you have expressed. My question is this, Peter Jennings, who was the head of ASPE, uh, 
some years ago made a statement three years ago that by this time, by this year, there would be a war between, I think he said, America and China. That was his prediction, according to an article in The Age. I think that's what it was. Now, uh, certain people uh, under the banner of that Red Alert series were saying the same thing. In the next three years, there will be a war. Projecting into the future, and we don't know the future, but what is your impression going forward? Is there a likelihood of a war? Um, do you see that happening? Or how do you view what is going to happen in the foreseeable future, given the fact that the world is still in a very unstable situation? Thank you. I'm just interested to know what you think of the, well, speak up, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, it seems to me I don't quite understand either why, why we're doing this, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it beggars belief really, because if you look at the US at the moment, uh, and what's playing what? out there, Perfect. why are we aligning ourselves with the US? And I'm curious to know whether, um, I mean, some people have s speculated that uh, the power that US has or uh, use some kind of, whether it's blackmail or bullying or whatever ways they actually do uh, is happening here. Now, this, this is just- Down, Just a couple of minutes and we are on. Because the same's happening in Europe where like, Germany, for instance, I mean, have have their have had their who are aligning themselves closely with the US, uh, but have had their sort of energy it's supply affected uh, by the US, and they seem to still, you know, it, it, in my opinion, the US is out, out to destroy Europe too oh, in yeah. terms of you know being the hegemonic whatever. Um, and why are we all well done. so compliant? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, at the back, yes. Oh, sorry. Let me get back there. Sorry. Adapting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm adapting to the phrase. Um, oh, phrase. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, it's phrase, really insightful. Phrase. Um, just curious, I often when we hear about political leaders, particularly in the global south, when they make certain decisions that are very obviously against their masses, um, people would say that's due to a significant lack of empathy and perhaps even violent towards their populations. And say for basically perhaps the abandonment perhaps of the of Australia yeah. or perhaps say for the abandonment of yes. Australia by the US what do you think needs to happen like what are the key political decisions that think that you think need to be made in order to shift our current political agenda towards something that is actually very favorable and really does look long term towards the benefit of the citizens of Australia, because it almost seems as though Australia seems to be ignorant no, or chooses to be okay, ignorant so of the fact that it is um, in a very interesting position geologically, physically, within the global and increasingly globalized political climate. So I guess following on from the previous question, why are we doing this and what do we need to do to shift it? Because it's a it's a type of pseudo violence in itself. Look, I'll try and do them in reverse order. Um, I think Australia has options to uh, more adroit diplomacy. Um, used to be called uh, self reliance within an alliance framework, but um, in some ways we've lost this idea that it's possible to remain an ally of the United States without signing up to every single dictate that comes our way, whereas other US allies have done this. So um, I think we could learn from other countries who are allied with the United States or closely uh, 
uh, close friends in the United States and said, well, that doesn't mean, it's not a, you know, you, you take a take all or nothing approach. I think it's possible to say, um, okay, we're, we see what your intentions are. We understand what you're trying to get out here. But our role in the region is different because we are more heavily dependent on China. We have developed over many years a very healthy trading relationship, a growing diplomatic relationship. We're not going to jeopardize that. Uh, we are going to very closely monitor the rise of China in the same way everyone else is. But look at some of the other countries in the region. Uh, you know, they're not going under, undergoing you know, some moral panic uh, because China now has more money to spend on its defense forces. But um, unfortunately, that model, those models, those alternative models of how to conduct yourself within an alliance framework seem to have been lost and need to be relearned, perhaps. That's, that's what I'd say, I think, to that point. Uh, to your question, um, Europe, the greatest fear the United States has had since 1945 is losing control of Europe. Uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine was a gift because it, it brought NATO back into uh, control of uh, European foreign policy. But we're still seeing what I call the rubber band effect, where you're getting now some resistance. Uh, unfor fortunately for the Europeans, they had a very mild winter. So the drain on their energy resources wasn't as dramatic as it might be next year. But, you know, there are some people who argue that Germany going, undergoing its current uh, route will de-industrialise if it has to keep spending that much on um, American gas. So uh, the Europeans want a constructive relationship with Russia at some point. They have to rebuild that. Um, and Macron's comments in Beijing about US leadership on Ukraine are indicative of a growing frustration within continental Europe, not the UK, but within continental Europe, that we must have a European way of doing this. Um, that's not to say Europe can suddenly become independent, but it has certainly doesn't have to automatically um, rubber stamp every US initiative. And it's clear that Macron, uh, Scholz to a certain extent, but also some of the other leaders believe that the US is unnecessarily prolonging, prolonging the war in Ukraine at great cost to many people, people who depend on food, exports, fertilizer, natural resources and gas and energy supplies. So watch that space. You know, there's a growing concern there. It's the rubber band effect. Suddenly you get pulled in to respond to Ukraine, a terrible crime, but on that, then you, as it goes on and on, you realize it's not necessarily in our interests to back this to the last Ukrainian, which is the, how it's been referred to. As far as war is concerned with, uh, I, I don't see a prospect of, I don't think the prospect of war with China has increased 1%. The reason for that is it's not in Australia's interests and it's not in China's interests. Now, if we were to be silly enough to argue that China could invade its own territory of Taiwan and therefore commit ourselves to the defense of a territory that we acknowledge is under Beijing sovereignty, we'd have lost our minds. So it's really, I mean, there's just no, there's no rational reason to do this. It would expose us to crippling economic sanctions, tension in the region, hostility from the other countries in Southeast Asia and East Asia. For what? You know, Taiwan is just not that important to Australia. So if you're going to be brutally... Well, the Americans, for example, want... Uh, they, the, the value that Taiwan has to America is semiconductor. They, they want to, it's going to take them years to replicate it and build up in their own economy a proficiency in the semiconductor industries that Taiwan has a global leadership of. But why would China retake Taiwan? Under what circumstances would, it, uh, would China do that? What, what would be the motive for it? Um, Taiwan is the largest investor in China. Why on earth would it want to jeopardize something like that? I mean, it might be crude in the way it, it behaves and, and the, the comments that are made about the Taiwanese leadership, just as they were crude about the Hong Kong issue, but they're money spinners for Beijing, as they are. To jeopardize all that with a high risk uh, invasion of, across the Taiwan Straits makes no sense for China. And the Americans 
I mean, you know, the Americans war, ga war gamed um, a conflict with Iran in the Persian Gulf, and every time they did it, they lost. How do you think they're going to go in Taiwan? Okay, it's, it makes no sense. It's made no, I think, but of course that, that doesn't play into the current narrative in the mainstream. The current narrative in the mainstream is that this, you know, this, this war is just a few years or less away. And notice that the people that they got on that Red Alert series in the Age and Sydney Morning Herald all had the same view. It was a series of carbon copies. There wasn't one person on that list who said, I don't believe any of this. I have a completely different view and here it is. Imagine in the modern world just producing a, a, a series of takes on Australia-China relations and not including anyone with a dissenting view. I mean, they're not very subtle. Okay, now we go to online. Do we have some? So a few online questions. One is, how can Australia and China successfully navigate the challenge of making each others feel safe? The other is, is Australia doomed to become the poor and defeated ally of Asia? And one is um, uh, asking you about what do you reckon would Australia sign the TPNW? For those who don't know what that is, it's the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And how would that affect the relations with China? Well, I think uh, sort of, it, I've already kind of mentioned that Australia needs to redirect its attention towards constructing uh, permanent dialogue with the Chinese, permanent dialogue where all the issues that are raised between the two can be dealt with without this being frozen out, without no one speaking or no one taking phone calls and picking up the phone. And um, one way that could be done is through regional forums. And we've always said Australia is engaged in the region. We want to further engage in the region, but we don't, we seem, don't seem to want to use any of those regional forums to bring China into our dialogue. So in my view, uh, for a fraction of the cost of what they're proposing to do with submarines, we could have engaged with China to have an ongoing dialogue. As I said, set up another 10 consuls in China. Right? Have more, get more Chinese students here. Make us inter interdependent on each other. The more you become interdependent, the more, um, likely it is that you'll find avenues for avoiding conflict in the future. And part of that is, you know, is the, is the um, arms control regime that you mentioned. Nuclear non-proliferation is extremely important to a country like Australia. We have a quite an honourable history in promoting the non-proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, um, as well as signing the Chemical Weapons Convention and other things. Uh, but um, again, uh, that takes patient, slow, constructive diplomacy. Now, I do give Penny Wong credit that she stabilised the relationship and that some of those sanctions have come off. Uh, she needs to go further, but she's going to be asked at some point when she does go to Beijing, uh, someone's going to come up and say, about those submarines, uh, where do you think they'll be sailing into? Exactly. And... Uh, what interpretation should we make about your new strategic posture because you've suddenly now uh, got a new naval um, force structure? At some point, someone's going to, in China is going to ask that, and there's no easy answer to it, which doesn't contradict all the other things that I suggest that she should do, which is to construct an ongoing permanent dialogue. There's lots of things that could be done. You know, annual meetings, annual uh, you know, bilateral meetings on a whole range of subjects that suddenly demystify the Chinese relationship and a more aggressive response to the sort of uh, mainstream media scare campaigns that we read in the Asian Sydney Morning Herald, which contribute nothing but putting people on edge for no, very, no reason really at all, because they're not even, I don't think any academic would read that and say, well, I'm going to prescribe that to my students to read. I mean, it's just a fear campaign. There's, no, there's almost no substance to it at all. But it, you know. Okay, I did have some hands here before. Uh, I don't know what order. Yes, please. 
Oh, oh, hello. Um, my name's Rosie Elliott. I'm one of those poor, rusted-on Labor Party members, and this is really ripping me up, as I think it is to all of us, all of the members. And I do not know what we're going to do. Um, in, in a month's time, our branch, which is all would be all saying the sort of things you're saying, we're having a meeting with our member who happens to be Peter Cahill, who's, I think, a hawk. I don't know, but I, appreciate, I think it pretty is. He's a very good local member. Um, or powered him, but I think he's a hawk, and I, I, I don't know what we're going to say. Am I going to throw a little tantrum and say I'm going to tear up my card? It is very. I have no power. I'm just a Labor Party foot soldier, you know. So I, I do. You've said you've just raised that question twice. What are we? What are we going to do? You know, and you didn't give an answer. I don't know an answer. Um, I wonder if you do have. Any thoughts in that direction? And what I should say to Peter Cahill when he comes to our branch meeting, um, that's the question to him. And that raises the next question. Um, to me, this terrible propaganda war where we're all being beaten, like, you know, with whips into this... Um, I've never seen propaganda like this. The nearest thing we can think about is the weapons of mass destruction. Um, I'm sure all of us were on the street against, um, against the war there, and look what good that did us. Um, and I wonder whether our leaders, because I'm trying to keep the faith with, with Albanese and Penny and, you know, like I'm trying to, um, and I'm thinking maybe they're just thinking, oh, it'll all go away in the future, you know, it'll all just disappear, the oceans will rise or whatever reason, it, you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll just won't get in trouble with the, you know, like Goff did. So what I want to know, are they being terrorised the way all the political leaders were about the weapons of mass destruction. I actively lied to by the CIA. I think we've so, got the questions. That's it. They're the two questions about Thank what's you. the analogy and what should we tell? I tell Peter Carl. Okay. Well, tell so Peter. Wait, oh, okay. We have another one. Yep. So as to get more people. Yes, please. Thank you, um, Dr. Birchall. I think you said it's sort of all right if China was to seize Taiwan because it's its own territory. And I think Stop you said, I think you said it's all right if China was to seize Taiwan because it's own territory. It's no, no, I territory. that's not my position. And, and I think you said China is not likely to seize Taiwan, even though they've been yeah. saying they will for quite a while. And the question that I want to ask you is: that in Australia's interests or against Australian interests, if China was to seize Taiwan? I think it's in Australia. I think I agree with Penny Wong that the, the status quo is the preferred option for Taiwan and for Australia. And that's the view that I think Australia does hold. That is to say, uh, no um, military invasion or, or attack across the Taiwan Straits. I certainly would not support it. And I don't think it's necessary or is likely to happen for the reasons I explained. I, I think the, Taiwan is a valuable resource for China in the current state. That it's in, I uh, I think the rhetoric is stupid that comes out of Beijing about Taiwan, and reckless, and indefensible in many ways. But you know we have to take the rhetoric separately from the actions. And I refer to your question: is when you talk to Peter Kale, ask him why uh, the National Conference of the Labor Party has twice pledged to recognise Palestine, and the government has not done it. So this is the gap between rhetoric, policy made at national conference, and what governments feel obliged to implement. And it's always been a huge cause of frustration for Labor Party members that they work feverishly to get things passed at the national conference and find government saying, putting it in the too hard basket as soon as they get into government. And all that uh, achieves is undermining the relationship between people like you in the branches You'll see branch attendance drop off. Uh, people get writing letters and getting kind of pro forma responses and why we, you know, we're still thinking about this. But again, um, you've got to understand that in within the ruling factions of the Labor Party, this policy is very popular. It's not a reluctantly drawn into something they don't like. They have been very pro uh, the United States for a long time, the right wing, particularly the right wing faction of the ALP. Uh, this is not new. Um, 
if you want to read it, as I said, I referred to the WikiLeaks cables before of when um, they used to run off to the US Embassy to prepare the way for Gillard's takeover over uh, Rudd. This is because uh, that's where they see their primary responsibility. They're as a loyal, reliable ally of the United States. But as I said, it posed the question in my, in my talk, what's the end game? Where do they think this will end up? Is, is it, are we just, should we accept permanent hostility? These sort of Cold War binaries that we thought we had finished with in uh, the early 1990s. You know, what, what is the end game? Where do they think this will lead? What do they think, how do they think China will respond to the AUKUS uh, submarine acquisitions? What do they think China will do? And I just don't think they've thought this through um, or they don't, they don't care, I don't know. But I can understand your frustration because you feel there's a gap between what, your, what the local members want and the, argue for and what comes up in terms of policy outcomes. Okay. Um, one more. Yes. Yeah. Last one from the uh, from here, and then we'll see if there are any more online. Ishan, I don't know. We'll tell you'll tell us in a minute. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, it's, this is more um, an observation on which I'd like your comment. Uh, you said that um, both on the Liberal side and the Labour Party side. Uh, the factions of the Labour Party that are in power in Canberra, uh, the policy of alignment with the United States is very popular. My own view is that uh, on both sides of politics, those who have been intimately exposed to the United States um, for quite some time through things like the leadership dialogue and other methods of brainwashing our leadership are very uh, well aware of what happens to a friend of the United States when it turns against United States policy. Um, and we can go back in history to uh, many, many examples. One that struck me personally because I was in Iran, um, not when it happened, but it was sort of part of my understanding of Iran, was that Iran was a close ally of the United States until Prime Minister Mossadegh decided to nationalize oil. And then, of course, he was violently overthrown and Iran flipped and flopped between being a friend of the United States and being an enemy of the United States. Um, so I personally believe that policy attitudes in Canberra are driven as much by fear of the United States as of friendship towards the United States. Uh, I think um, John Mearsheimer uh, in Canberra in this discussion with Hugh White said that Australia is well aware that the United States can do Australia much more damage than China can. And so we are caught in this schizophrenic policy of saying to China, we have to go to war against you in order to protect our trade with you, which of course is completely insane. Look, I just, I just say uh, we do tend to underestimate the significance that some parts of Australian military uh, bases have for the United States. I think Pine Gap is one of the most important military bases in the American sphere. And uh, we never leverage that power and those bases to achieve some degree of perceived independence. If the government was smart, it might not want to be independent, but at least it could see to be, be seen to be more independent within the framework of the alliance. But we have, we're not, we're not, yes, the US can extract all sorts of sanctions and punishment for those who uh, it sees as being disloyal. But Australia has, has always gone further than most allies. Uh, it still does. We're the greatest non-NATO contributor to the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're always going the extra step. We're the only country in the world that's been involved in the five major wars of the 20th century. Uh, we've always been trying to prove our bona fides to the United States, but it's come at a cost. And it's not always the shrewdest thing to do when you're trying to extract some attention, uh, extract some uh, extract some benefits, but also redirect the alliance into a 
a, a direction which is much more palatable for our interests. And the thing that is, we should be telling the Americans is, look, you know, we know your geopolitical interests are not going to be suddenly changed by us, but you do need to understand ours are different. You do need to know that there are countries who were, remained allies with you who refused to fight in the Vietnam War. There are, they refused to participate in the war in Iraq. They stayed allies and they stayed friends. And Australia seems to think that it's an either or thing. You can't get anything in between. And uh, as I said, that comes at a cost because if your new government comes into power and simply endorses the previous one, voters who don't believe in those policies or don't support them have virtually nowhere to go. Hey, Sean, any questions? No. Uh, well, we have time for one more question if there is one. That was the fastest hand I've ever seen, so. <laughs> Just for online, no, we need online anyway. people. Thank you. So, so, and I had it in my head as I stood up. Um, if our governments can't see this problem, this nuance, and, and they not, for whatever reason, not willing to make the changes that we all seem to agree need to be made, what can civil society do about it? Should I be knocking on Penny Wong's door? Should I be writing pen friend letters to Xi Jinping? But what, what should I be doing? Well, it's a very, it's a very good question. I'm, uh, I apologize for not having a very good answer. Um, but what you need to understand is that the relative position of the Foreign Affairs Department has reduced and continues to significantly reduce in relation to the Department of Defense now as a result of these acquisitions. So we're almost mimicking the US situation where defense is far more significant than the Department of State in terms of budgets and in relative influence. What we need to do is, is put pressure to reverse that. Okay, if you're going to do, spend all this money, what about giving some, I mean, DFAT is chronically underfunded. It's closing missions around the world. Um, what about trying to get, uh, you know, increase the diplomatic presence, particularly in the region, as a counterweight, because a lot of these things have to be explained. You have to explain to the Indonesians why we've got submarines heading past through the Straits of Malacca, you know? Um, and, you know, they may not be happy about this, or they may not understand that this is a benign change of policy. And, you know, if it, this is the same. This is what happened with Malaysia. It's what happened with Indonesia in the last few days. They, they sat back, they've looked at Orcus and they said, can't see anything for us in this. You know, we were actually quite worried about this. That this brings greater instability to the region, not stability. So we've got a lot of homework to do to reassure the region that south of China, between China and us, that there's a whole lot of uh, work needs to go into to explain that what we're doing here is... Uh, St stabilizing the region because the presence of nuclear um, powered submarines floating around that part of the world is not going to endear ourselves to too many, I wouldn't think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll thank our speaker in a moment, but uh, I think that's as far as we can go this evening uh, in terms of engaging with Scott. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to bring to your attention, uh, and uh, perhaps um, Emily will show a slide which tells us something about um, uh, the program that Conversation at the Crossroads has in mind. As you know, we've already had, this is the second one of the Voices series, and um, we have three more to go, and they'll be held at uh, six weekly intervals. So the next one is 13th of June. You will be advised of the details very soon, uh, but I can tell you that we're going to go into a completely different area and deal with the problem of mental health or ill health, uh, which has um, uh, developed pandemic proportions in Australia.
and uh, look at the causes and possible remedies, particularly as it affects uh, uh, a younger generation. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have um, big ideas in the pub. And um, in a moment, I'll show you the details of the next one coming up. We've already had one of these and another one to follow later this month. Uh, politics in the, pub, in the park is something we've had in mind for a little while, and uh, we'll no doubt hear more about that too. It'll be a more informal uh, occasion, social occasion, but also some serious discussion. And we have had, for the best part of a year, uh, conversations that matter, small groups meeting, uh, dealing with a range of issues, each group about 10, 8, 10, 12 people maximum, uh, dealing with a particular issue uh, on an ongoing basis. And um, sometimes for six months, for a year, whatever it be, we're going to strengthen further some of our existing groups and probably establish uh, a couple more, perhaps more, uh, over the next few months. So you'll hear more about that as well. So going back to uh, big ideas in the pub, the next slide, here is the next one, uh, which will be uh, on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament because so much hangs on it, uh, one way or the other. And that will be on Thursday, May the 25th. But you do need to register. It's uh, partly informal over a meal at the pub in Fitzroy. Uh, for those who live in Melbourne, it's not uh, uh, made for online attendance. This is purely an in-person uh, event. Uh, for those who live uh, in Melbourne. So I hope that some of you may be interested in coming. Uh, let me say one more thing which arises from the program of conversations that matter. One, and it's in answer to some of the questions, what can we do? We must develop conversations. It's critical. It's the only thing that can make a difference. The only thing. There's no point talking about action. How are you going to get to action? What kind of action? By whom? In relation to what? Taking what form? Only one thing can answer those questions. Conversation. And so uh, the question was addressed in relation to uh, Labour Party members. Are they engaged in active, energetic, intensive conversation with all and sundry in their communities? Are they holding public gatherings on the issues that are of concern to them? And inviting people outside of Labour, uh, if it's the Labour Party, uh, outside of uh, Labour luminaries, outsiders who speak with a different voice. They should be bringing them together in their dozens, not once, but repeatedly. It takes a lot of effort. It, you need to establish your credentials. But after all, what's a Labour Party branch except for that? To be a force, a force for good in the community and not just forever uh, being, if you like, focused exclusively on the internal disputes and debates within the Labour Party. It's got to go wide, wild, wide uh, and engage the community as a whole. So that's something we can all do, whether we are members of a party or whether we're not, we have to engage formally and informally in structured conversations, informal conversations, online and in person, one-to-one, -one, small groups, larger groups, much larger groups, public meetings. Let there be public meetings with hundreds and thousands attending. It, that's how it used to be done. And it can be done again, even in the uh, social media age. And the social media can be used for that purpose. So conversation about the defining issues of our time and how this place we call Australia uh, is to navigate those waters. And one thing I think we should be saying is that with the voice to parliament, the referendum coming up, we should make it clear that the voices that need to be heard are not only just about 
employment and incarceration and so on. Because these are the people that have never ceded sovereignty. And yet we are ceding it, even though we haven't got it in the first place, to third parties. Have they ever been asked whether it's appropriate to have foreign forces established on this soil? A base right in the middle of clusters of communities, a foreign base, were they ever asked? Will they be asked in the future? And when they have something to say about it, will they be listened to? There's a, there's a test, there's a test. Um, so much to do uh, over the coming months and years. Um, and one final thing, in principle, uh, this government is committed to signing uh, the treaty. I'm, I'm only mentioning it because it was the point of a question. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We haven't heard very much about it, except that they're considering the issues. And will they do so, if ever they do, by declaring themselves totally opposed to any activity which engages nuclear weapons. That they, from now on, do not wish to be protected under the nuclear deterrent. Otherwise, what's the point of signing up? Meaningless. It's what you do when you don't really mean to be supportive of uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons. And if you do, then you have to become an advocate for lots of other allies of the United States to do likewise, assuming we go down that train. So there is much to do on all of these issues and they're interconnected and conversation is going to be terribly important uh, in uh, making some inroad into this, into very difficult questions, indigenous rights, uh, mental health, uh, foreign and defense policy and the, and the likes. The role of media, ownership and control of the media. There is so much that needs attention. Uh, and you can't deal with one to the exclusion of the others. How can you have an independent foreign and defense policy, if anyone's interested in that, and have the current media that we do have? How could you? Inconceivable. You couldn't. How could you have a foreign independent policy with the kinds of bureaucrats civil and military servants and advisors that you have now. Impossible, impossible. Who do you turn to for advice? Who do you turn to for implementation of policy? So all of these things need to be thought through. It's not let's just have a policy, it's uh, how you're going to get to the policy and how you're going to implement it. And that can only happen in the event of an informed, thoughtful, respectful set of conversations nationwide. Only that can provide. So I'm making an advertisement for the importance of conversation and we in conversation at the crossroads, it's a drop in the bucket and hopefully can be multiplied many times over by others and by ourselves in the times ahead. So uh, can I just invite you all to join us for some more food and uh, drinks. Uh, please stay and engage in some conversation of the informal kind. And before I close, I want to thank, uh, of course, our speaker, uh, who fielded many questions and addressed many issues. And uh, I think uh, we are greatly appreciative of your contribution, Scott. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank very much all those who've contributed to the staging of this event. Uh, including the people who looked after the technical aspect uh, of tonight's proceeding, Emily and Jackson. And, uh, and many other volunteers, including Rita, my wife, who helped to put together the kits that you have and much else, and many others. And many others who have contributed to this series and will continue to do so. So thank you. Uh, till we meet again, lots of conversation. Yes, hands up. All the book. Um, we
we couldn't, uh, we couldn't, though we considered it, include uh, the report of a fascinating inquiry into uh, the US alliance, Australia's foreign policy, the possibilities of a more independent and peaceful um, set of policies than we've been used to. Um, it was uh, a people's inquiry that had 260 submissions. Uh, it produced lots of very interesting ideas and uh, suggestions and recommendations. And the inquiry report has now been published. Uh, we couldn't afford to put it in your kits, but for the miserly sum of $5, you can get a copy of that report. Uh, I think it's at the table at, as you go out. Uh, you can please feel free uh, to purchase a copy, which you can then make a subject of conversation. People don't have to agree with what it says, uh, but it can be the subject of very useful conversation. Chart, it's called Charting a New Course. So uh, uh, if you can pick up a copy, do so and share it with as many others as you can. All right, thank you. And as I was about to say, till we meet again, uh, please enjoy the food and drinks in the meantime. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. In the, in the past, I've walked off with these things.